All right, so this is the genetic, or the, sorry, the GWAS one, GWAS concept questions. All right, uh, who's up? You're up for reading, right? What's the difference between a continuous trait and a case control trait? Yes. Uh, continuous trait has like a phenotype that's like on a spectrum, basically, where like we look at height, and it's like it's not that height comes in like discrete <coughs> values like the case control one does, where it's just whether or not you're affected, which is a very concrete kind of yes or no. Exactly, yeah. Case control is usually. Um, usually disease related, you have the disease or you don't have the disease. Let's say you do have a continuous trait though. For instance, uh, <clears throat> obesity. I want my cases to be people who are obese and controls to be people who aren't obese. Well, what exactly is obesity? This is the way we characterize it based on BMI. Right, and what's BMI? Is it continuous or discrete? Yeah, so you can convert a continuous trait into a discrete trait by basically putting a threshold on it and saying anyone with a BMI over this, we're gonna call a case and everyone else is a control. That's, so you can kind of move continuous data into the case control realm, but you can't move case control into continuous very easily or at all, I don't think. So, yeah. All right, next question, Rose. Why is it that a genetic variant can affect a phenotype, but a phenotype cannot affect a genetic variant? Because you're um, born through genetics, and that comes first, and everything else is react. It changes based on that genetics, but you wouldn't really get affected by an environment. That wouldn't really like change your DNA. Exactly. Yeah, your genetics you're born with, and so that can affect other things, but through time as you develop diseases and traits, those don't affect your genetics at all. Um, some of the, there are actually diseases that I believe do change your genetics a little bit and different environments can change your genetics. Um, but those are kind of edge cases of diseases. Most traits we think about like height, BMI, diabetes, stuff like that, your genetics is very much fixed. Yes. GWAS on height and test 2,000 independent genetic variants for association with height. What significance threshold should you use to control the, say, um, if we go here at a 0.05 rate? Why is this necessary? Uh, you could use uh, 0.05 divided by 2,000. Exactly. And that's necessary because it's, uh, you're more, you're, more likely to have, you, you're putting more kind of stringent restriction on what we consider significant in our association. Yeah. If we don't do that, what's our family-wise error rate and false discovery rate going to be like in our study? If we don't control the family-wise error rate, if you just like, if you choose a significant special <laughs> first, well then you're more likely to have higher family-wise error a higher false discovery. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah, so we do that because we want to make sure that when we have discoveries, we're, we're pretty confident that they actually are discoveries. Yep. All right. Next question. What is the difference between true effect size and an estimated effect size? How are they represented? So true effect size is when you know that that's an Wait, did we lose a person? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You just got into it. All right, well, we're gonna skip somebody here. It used to be alternating really well. Like, wait, the same people keep answering. Okay, well, you can keep answering this one. It'll alternate if we read after we answer. I, I'm gonna put myself into the loop here, oh, okay. too, yeah. Um, okay, so a true effect size is when you know that a SNP, or like that allele is affecting um, the tree for sure, but an estimated effect size is, is when you, you say you think it is because you don't really know if there's like other factors like LD and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then they're represented by like beta and beta hat. Exactly. Yeah, so the beta hat says we think that this is an estimate for whatever this actual beta is, but we're not, we're not certain. All right, so here, what's the next question? I can read this one. I'll take that on. Okay, if a genetic variant has a significant p-value, why, does it, why is it not right to assume that the genetic variant has a non-zero effect on the phenotype? <laughs> I'm not sure. 
All right, so you've, you've, you have two SNPs. Yes. And you test both of them, and they're in perfect LD. And you get a, the same p-value for both of them and the same estimated effect for both of them. Which one of them actually has a true non-zero effect? I don't think I'm like understanding the question properly. Okay, got it. Okay, so you, you've tested a SNP, yeah. and you get a significant p-value, yeah. and you get some effect estimate. Why should you not then conclude that this SNP actually is a causal risk SNP for some disease? Exactly. Say for sure that that one was the sole thing that's actually contributing to that disease. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So you can read the next question. What's the difference between the top GWAS hit and the GWAS locus, and why do GWAS loci exist? Um, I said the top GWAS hit is like the highest one. On mm -hmm. The most significantly. The most significant associated yeah. snap, yeah. And then the GWAS locus is an area of the genome that appears to have an effect on the phenotype. Yeah, I wouldn't say necessarily an area of the genome, but that has an effect, but rather an area of the genome where you know there's something in the genetics okay. that has an effect. And that's where you see the like, you know, 30 SNPs all having a significant association, but you don't actually know which one of them is, is in fact has a true effect. Yep. And then GOS exists because of LD? Yes, because of LD. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't account for covariates, which is population structure, structure, what risks do you run? I think I, I answer this one. Um, yeah, you basically get false discoveries if you don't account for population structure. Um, so a really good example of this is, let's say you do a GWAS on height, and you have a bunch of European individuals, and at like some SNP, the A allele is really common. And then you also have a bunch of pygmy individuals, and at that same SNP, the T is really common. And so now I regress height on genetics. Well, what's gonna pull out is this SNP where the A allele was common in Europeans and the T allele is common in pygmies, because pygmies are really short, Europeans are taller than pygmies, and so basically what's gonna happen is there's this one variant that really is just different between these two populations, but because those two populations are both in your GWAS, you're gonna find variants that differentiate populations as opposed to variants that differentiate height, and that's population structure. And so that's when you do like, when you use those principal components, that will actually pick up on all of these sorts of differences and try to account for them and then remove those from the estimation so that you don't pick up on them. And it's not perfect, but it works very well. So, um, all right, and then Kim, you're reading the next question. Oh, no other questions, perfect, all right. Well, in that case, thank you guys so much for everything.